Gee, Hoib. It sure is swell to go walking. We ain't done it for such a long time. Took an awful lot of talking on my part to get you to do it, though. Yeah? Well, I can think of lots of other things I'd rather be doing. But getting a few bunions is better than having your jaw at me for the rest of the day. Come on. Let's cut through this street. Eh, yeah, what's the matter with the street we're on? We're just out walking, ain't we? Yeah, but I just thought I'd like to walk on Spruce Street. Gee, Hoy, can't you be nice, huh? Gee, Hoy, can't you be nice, huh? Eh, yeah, come on, let's cross here and head for Spruce. Oh, ain't it nice out, though? Gee, it's good to get out of the apartment. Yeah, ain't it just fine and dandy? What's the hurry, though? What you gotta walk so fast for, Hattie? We ain't racing nobody. No, we ain't racing. But this ain't a very interesting street. It'll be much nicer over on Spruce. Say, the fact that Hinklebaum's jewelry store is right around the corner in Spruce ain't the reason we had to come this way by any chance. Hey, where you going? Home, you big lug. Home. <laughs> See if I ever ask you to go walking with me again. Maybe our friend was overly suspicious, but I can't say I blame him. Maybe that's because that's the frame of mind I'm in myself right now. You see, it's this way. According to our old friend Noah Webster, a sieve is an apparatus with meshes through which the finer particles of a pulverized substance are passed to separate them from the coarser particles. And I have a suspicion that maybe our science reporter is trying to pull a fast one, for he says that on this excursion in science, he's going to tell us about sieves for sorting nuclei. Now, since I have an idea of the very minute nature of nuclei, I wonder if he isn't trying to go a little far in saying anything about sieves in connection with them. Well, we'll let him work himself out of this one if he can. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Emerson Markham. Thank you, Bob Stone, and how do you do, everyone? I'm not suffering from hallucinations, Bob. In fact, calling them sieves for sorting nuclei was the idea of Dr. H.C. Pollock of the General Electric Research Laboratory. Okay, but just what is it we'll be venturing into, Emerson? Well, Bob, the recent use of atomic energy, formerly impossible to man, climaxed a five-year period of intensive scientific research and development. Many new discoveries were made during the course of this work, and many techniques were improved far more than seemed possible a few years ago. During this excursion, we shall be looking into several methods of separating atoms, which were developed to remove the rare and valuable form of uranium known as U-235 from the more plentiful associated form of uranium known as U-238. Well, that promises to be interesting. Fire away. Most elements found on the Earth have forms which are alike chemically, but which differ slightly in weight. Those are called isotopes, aren't they? Yes, Bob, they are. The existence of isotopes is explained by the physicist as due to the presence of more or less mass in the nuclei of the atoms composing the ordinary elements with which we are all familiar. Now it happens that ordinary tin has been found to possess more isotopes than any other element, there being tin atoms of 11 different weights mixed together in any sample of the metal. In the case of uranium, there are three varieties or isotopes. In nature, these three isotopes of uranium were so thoroughly mixed in the beginning that wherever uranium ore is mined, whether in Colorado, Canada, Australia, Madagascar, Russia, or the Congo, 99 and 2 tenths percent of the uranium is what we call U-238. 7 tenths of 1 percent is U-235, and less than 1 one hundredth of 1 percent is U-234. The existence of these three uranium isotopes had been known for some years, but not until 1939 did this information seem to be of more than academic interest. What happened in 1939, Emerson? The possibility of producing an atomic bomb of U-235 became apparent in that year, Bob. The separation of the uranium isotopes appeared a direct and a major step toward making such a bomb. And with the outbreak of war in Europe, great attention was directed to this new problem. Familiar chemical methods offered little help for so far as their chemistry goes, the atoms of the uranium-235 isotope are just like those of the 238 isotope. Isotopes must be separated by processes which depend strongly on their mass differences. And as we cannot get at the atoms directly, for they are too small, we must devise ways of applying forces to them. I suppose quite a few things came to mind when they were starting out to find a solution. Well, the method of fractional distillation, which is used so much to separate liquids of different boiling point, particularly in the oil industry, might be thought to offer some hope. It can be used in separating hydrogen isotopes where the mass differences are relatively large. In the case of uranium, however, it turns out to be hopelessly impractical. Is the high-speed centrifuge the instrument for which we are looking? Don't look at me, Emerson. Well, anyway, Bob, 
in the same way that the familiar cream separator removes cream from milk, we might hope to get the light uranium-235 atoms to come to the center of the spinning rotor and the 1% heavier-238 atoms to go to the outside if we centrifuge the proper uranium compounds. Special centrifuges do work, but the rotor must spin with enormous peripheral speed. The numbers of machines required, the slowness of the separation, and the many mechanical problems have discouraged plans to use this method on a large scale. So they had to look towards another method, I suppose. What was it, Emerson? Another method of isotope separation is known as gaseous diffusion, Bob. Back in 1896, Lord Rayleigh in England pointed out that a mixture of two gases of different atomic weight could be partly separated by allowing some of the gas to diffuse through a porous barrier into a vacuum. The lighter molecules get through the holes in the barrier faster than the heavier ones on the average. Separation is rather small and the process is slow, but with a very large plant containing many successive stages of barriers and pumps, one may hope to get an appreciable output of partly separated material. The process looked very difficult in the case of uranium, for its only known gases are very corrosive. But they solved the problem this time? Yes, Bob, they did. The large group of scientists who worked on this problem during the war were finally able to develop a satisfactory metal barrier through which this gas could be pumped. By using special pumps, new lubricants, and many precautions, the whole diffusion process was finally made to operate successfully on a factory scale. The men who worked on this process from 1940 to 1945 deserve great credit for their courage and their persistence as well as their technical ability. Is this the only way to separate the isotopes, Emerson? No, Bob. Another method of uranium isotope separation, which proved practical on a large scale, is that by means of the mass spectrograph. What's that? Within this process, which was largely developed and perfected in the laboratory of Professor E.O. Lawrence at the University of California, the vapor of a uranium compound is first electrically charged. Then the charged atoms, or ions as they are now called, are accelerated to very high velocities by electric fields. The fast ions are bent around curved paths by these strong magnetic fields. The heavy ions of U-238 are bent less than the light U-235 ions, so the two materials can be collected in different, separate slots. I suppose this mass spectrograph business is very new. No, Bob, not really. The method of the mass spectrograph has been familiar since Aston built the first small instrument at Cambridge University in 1919. But it was not until the intensive war development set in that the instrument became capable of giving sufficiently large outputs to be of value in this problem. In the development of this machine, the magnet of the large Berkeley, California cyclotron was extensively used. This magnet is the largest electromagnet in the world, having a pole face diameter of 184 inches and a gap of 72 inches. This process of separating uranium isotopes just described is known as the electromagnetic method and sometimes the machines are referred to as calutrons. Do you get a greater isotope separation in one process than in another, Emerson? Well, Bob, the degree of isotope separation affected by any process depends on the inherent efficiency of each stage, times the number of successive stages which are put into use. It becomes apparent when the electromagnetic plant was operating that if it could use uranium compounds, which had already been previously enriched somewhat in U-235, the total plant output could be increased. For this reason, use was made of still another scheme for isotope separation. Another? What was that? It is known as the thermal diffusion method. For some years, it had been known that uh, if there are temperature differences in a vessel containing a mixed gas, there is a tendency for one type of gas molecule to concentrate in the cold region and the other in the hot region. Such effects were first applied to separating isotopes by two Germans in 1938. Scientists in our Naval Research Laboratory perfected a similar method, which used thermal diffusion in a liquid. By 1943, it was possible to plan a thermal diffusion plant capable of accomplishing some uranium separation. When such a plant was built the following year at Oak Ridge, it increased the production rate of the other processes with which it was associated. And so in summary, we might say that the urgency of the situation in 1943, when work at Oak Ridge, Tennessee was started, required that every possible hopeful way of separating the explosive U-235 be attempted. Intensive research and development carried forward jointly by the scientists of America and Great Britain produced several possible solutions to the problem. Unremitting efforts by the great group of people working for the Manhattan Project brought the necessary factories into successful operation. With new atomic sieves, 
man was able to separate potent U-235 from its age-long partner, U-238. And so on July 15th of 1945 in the New Mexico desert, man saw the first atomic bomb transmute part of its mass to an instantaneous release of energy, which had been latent to the U-235 from the beginning of the Earth. Our thanks, Emerson, to you and to Dr. Pollock for making us acquainted with the story of those sieves. And ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to have a copy of a paper which contains the facts we've just brought you, a paper written by Dr. H.C. Pollock of the General Electric Research Laboratory, all you have to do to get your copy is address your request to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are now listening, asking for scientific paper number 226, entitled Sieves for Sorting Nuclei. That's Sieves for Sorting Nuclei, scientific paper number 226. Your copy will be sent to you free of charge. Now, once again, we've come to that portion of our program regularly devoted to the answering of questions dealing with what you want to know about scientific matters. The inquiries have been sent in by members of our audience, and the answers you will hear are based on facts provided by staff members of the General Electric Research Laboratory. And here's the first matter for your attention, Emerson. The letter comes from a lady in Wisconsin who tells us that she has difficulty finding a comb that will not bend and break after a short period of usage because her hair is unusually heavy. She had tried combs of various materials, she says, but none has lasted more than a month or two. She wants to know if we have any suggestions. Oh, prior to the war, metals such as aluminum were made into excellent combs, which did not bend and break after being used for a short time. Uh, they will no doubt be on the market again soon, as well as combs made of hard plastics, which, are, which were developed during the war. Next, we have this one from a man in Ashley, Pennsylvania, who writes, I work at a power plant, and in the wintertime, we have a great deal of trouble with ice formation on the grill and fans of the cooling tower. Is there anything I can paint them with to prevent this? There is a possibility of putting propylene glycol or glycerin or some other antifreeze mixture on them that would tend to prevent the ice from forming. A number of applications will be necessary, I should think. Carnauba wax is used in treating ice trays and ice boxes, and although it would be more durable, it would perhaps be less effective. Well, next we have this letter from a lady who asks, what causes storm windows to steam up and what can be done to prevent it? If the storm windows steam and oftentimes frost, it evidently means that some of the more humid air from inside the house is getting into the space between the two windows. So, what did you suggest she do? Well, weather stripping around the windows might keep the warmer air out of the space, and then the trouble would be eliminated. Another remedy would be to put a dish containing calcium chloride in the space between the windows to keep that space dry. Then steam would not appear and frost would not form. However, this would be rather a nuisance since the calcium chloride would have to be replaced frequently. Also, it might help if the storm windows uh, didn't fit quite tightly. This, of course, would be at the expense of heating the home, the very thing that our listener wouldn't want, I presume. So our best bet would be the weather stripping. Right. All right, Emerson, let's get on to this next communication from a friend who says, we have a cat which is suffering greatly from fleas. Is there any new method we could use to rid him of this nuisance? Uh, what about DDT? Well, we'd recommend, if it can be obtained, a rotenone containing flea powder, such as is sold in pet shops. This is entirely harmless to warm-blooded animals. And, as our friend says, what about DDT? Well, we've heard that DDT should not be used on cats because they tend to lick it off. However, if our listener could get a dry 4% DDT dusting powder having a talc base, a single thorough application should not be harmful if the excess is brushed or washed from the animal's coat about an hour after applying. This treatment should rid the cat of fleas. A gentleman in Enid, Oklahoma, asks which is a better conductor of electricity, copper or carbon? Oh, copper is several hundred times a better conductor of electricity than carbon, Bob. And a listener in Brooklyn, New York, asks, how much lift is an airplane given by the air blown under it by the propeller? Oh, no lift is obtained from propeller backwash underneath the plane, Bob. Well, somebody will start an investigation to see if there isn't some kind of lift they can apply to us if we don't leave when our time is up. So let me hastily say, thank you, Emerson Markham, and goodbye, everyone, until our next excursion in science. <laughs> 